Bow with me for prayer. Father, as we bow in your presence, we thank you for your grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. And Father, we just bow before you, thanking you that you gave your son Jesus to die on a cross. You sent your Holy Spirit, opened our minds, our eyes, our life. You brought us from dead to life so that we might have a hope of heaven that we'd spend all eternity with you. Father, I pray you'll be with the reading and preaching of your word today. Father, help us hear from you. Speak to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. have to shift gears now since I taught the Sunday school lesson in uh, 1 Corinthians 14. Uh, look forward to preaching through 1 Corinthians 14, or I think I do, I don't know, I might, I might better not be looking forward to that, but I look forward to, to studying uh, through that. Miss Jan, you can go home and and tell Brother Don I talked about him today. I just like the way she put it. I asked, I asked her how uh, Don was doing. She said, when I left, he was getting ready, or he was fixing to. That's a good, he was fixing to get in his recliner. Now, that's the way I like to do a day. I don't know what he was doing ahead of time, but he was fixing to really go to work. He was going to get in his recliner for the day. So you can tell him I, I, I talked about him from the pulpit this morning. I like it when I can be fixing to get into my recliner and enjoy the day. Well, as uh, Paul, uh, what's his name? Not Paul Harvey, but uh, uh, Family Feud, Paul or Harvey. Steve Harvey, how'd you get to, as Steve Harvey would say, we've got a good one for you today, and it's certainly not because of me, I'm going to read the text, but the Apostle Paul, and we've entitled this, Christ, the Power and Wisdom of God. It's going to be somewhat like he started out to the Roman church, because you, you remember, I've quoted it many times, what the power of God was to the, to the Roman church. I'm not ashamed, say it with me, of the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation to all those who believe, to the Jew first and also to the, to the Greek. And in this passage, we don't see mention the power of God twice in a little bit different uh, uh, tweak to it. Uh, here in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. I listened to uh, Brother David Dixon's message last week. It is on YouTube. Thank you, Jeff, for doing that. And you can listen to all the messages. Go to our uh, website or just go to YouTube and put in First McNeil, uh, and you can listen to the messages. But I, I noticed that he... Uh, started his sermon out, and then he said, I'll be reading from the ESV, and I do read from the ESV uh, from time to time. I study from it a lot, and this morning I've chosen to use the ESV again. It's the English Standard Version, and so uh, it'll read a little bit different to your uh, version, your King James, or even New King James. So verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing. But to us who are being saved, all of you reading from the King James says just all those that are saved. But I looked it up. The text does say being saved. It's interesting. Are being saved, it is the power of God. For the word of the cross your text is going to say the preaching of the cross or perhaps the message of the cross. This version says the word of the cross because the original language uses the word logos. This one got it right. This is exactly what the Greek text says. 
it uses the Greek word logos. The importance of that word comes to us out of John's gospel when John introduced Jesus in the beginning was the logos and the logos was was with God and the logos was God. He used that word logos to uh, translate it word. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God in verse 14 of John 1. And the Word and the Logos became flesh, meaning Jesus Christ, the incarnation it's called, and he dwelt among us. And so to pick this up here, uh, that Paul actually used this word Logos, and we see it translated for us, and the, uh, for the word of the cross. That doesn't mean just to speak the word Christ. It's not speaking of just a word, that if you speak, cross, you've spoken a word that has some, um, some great meaning to it and just speaking the word, but logos is the totality of something. It's the totality of the idea. And so when we look at it from the logos of the cross, he's not speaking just about the beam of which, the, the wood of which Jesus, huh? he's talking about the whole totality of what happened with Jesus Christ, his, his beating, his, his being mocked, his betrayal, his death, his burial, and his resurrection. For the word, the totality of the cross is folly, or your Bible probably says foolishness. And it's the Greek word moros, from which we get our word moron for the word the totality of the message preached to the world sounds moronic that's what Paul is saying and do we not see that in society today when they look at us as the preachers of the gospel that's why uh, preaching is is not a bad way to say that it's the it's the fourth telling of the message of which this translation just said uh, was a literal translation, the Logos, when, when the world hears it, for the word of the cross is moronic. We're as morons to those who are perishing, but to us, don't you like that pronoun, to us, that believe to us who are being saved. And that's the correct uh, translation of the Greek text as well. It's, it's there. So what in the world does that mean? To us who are being saved. I thought I was saved. Well, you've heard me talk about this before. There's three, three big theological words that kind of sum up what salvation in our are living as Christians and are one day dying and going to heaven. Three big words in our theology that uh, sum that up. And the first one is justification. And justification is the part that we normally think of when we talk about being saved by grace. That's why amazing grace is so important because we cannot save ourselves. We are justified by the fact that Christ died on a cross and paid the debt of which sin had cost the world because all have sinned and all are going to die and all are going to go to hell except for those who have been justified, redeemed, saved, born again, all those different words that we find in Scripture. The second big word, though, is sanctification. Paul starts out even chapter 1 here, this letter to Corinth, uh, saying that he was writing to the church at Corinth and to the saints. And saints is just an abbreviated term, or it's the noun form of, of what sanctification is. And sanctification is the maturing process of Christians. If you want to think about a baby, a baby is born a baby grows, a baby dies. Justification is our being born again, a born in, into a, 
into Christ. Our sanctification is our lifetime of growth. And then one day, as Christians, we die and go to heaven. But sanctification is extremely important. In Paul's theology, if there's no sanctification, it's because there's no justification. Guys, I, that's, that's a mouthful that that one word changed or that one word made us aware. Being saved. The writer of Hebrews says that if you can go out here and sin and live like you want to and live for the devil your whole life and Christ never chastens you, then the King James uses the old bastard word, or illegitimate. God is not your father. I've often said, how is it that we can expect the Holy Spirit of the living God to indwell us and never change anything? In fact, for some, they go the opposite direction while claiming to be a Christian. We are being saved because we are saved in justification. That's where faith comes from. We have to believe. However you look at this subject of God's calling and man's belief, the text is plain. There has to be faith. There has to be belief. And from that, there is a growing then. My goodness, we've seen in a first hand, uh, Miss Carolyn and their family of what happens when when a, a baby uh, is mistreated or when a baby, let's just say, quits growing, quits maturing. It, it's tragic, and there's something going on. It's something wrong when that happens because the normal process is birth. And then you grow into maturity. And that's what Paul, I think, is alluding to here as we look at our, uh, the, the subject of, of justification, sanctification that leads us to glorification. When we die, we go to heaven. We never lose our salvation. But if there's never any evidence of any Christian maturity or the whipping of God along the way, then we could we we're pretty safe to say, then you better you better check up on your salvation to see if indeed you are saved. So so Paul is saying to the Corinthian church, the word of the cross, the totality of the message of Jesus Christ dying on a cross is just moronic. In fact, the word uh, for uh, for uh, Moron could also be foolish or stupid. That looked it up. That's the that's the definition of of a, of a moron. We're, it's just a it's just stupid to think. And when you address people today and you tell them, "Hey, there was a Jewish man that lived, you know, thousands of miles over there in Israel, two thousand years ago, and your eternity, heaven or hell, is dependent on what he does." And the, and the natural man say that's just stupid. No, I don't. I don't believe that at all. That has no bearing on me. I'm going to heaven because I live good, or or because I hadn't done all these bad things. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. And then look at how he uh, illustrates that. He picks up a verse out of Isaiah. It doesn't say. Uh, here, but this is where it came from, for it is written, Isaiah said this, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Well, if you would have expected him to have the perfect illustration if the Holy Spirit of God's leading him, guys, he had the perfect illustration. He picked up on a scenario where Sennacherib, the, the king of Assyria, had come down and encamped around Jerusalem and had sent word into Hezekiah, the king, and said, 
uh, if you'll pay us so much money, then and and be uh, you know, then we'll take care of you and and let you stay uh, until we get ready to relocate you. But but we will relocate you at some future time. But we'll take care of you. And uh, Hezekiah sent word to Isaiah, and Isaiah went before God, and God told Isaiah to tell Hezekiah that uh, uh, they would not be taking over Jerusalem, not to fear him, uh, that he was the one in control. And so uh, uh, Sennacherib sends his messenger up there and says to the people on the wall, in fact, uh, it's, it's a long story in 2 Kings about this. And so in, in 2 Kings, uh, Sennacherib sends his messenger up there, and all the men are on the wall, and, and uh, some of the, the, the officers come out and say, don't speak to us in, 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 in Hebrew because they'll all understand it. Speak to us in your language so that we can just converse, and they won't know what's going on. And uh, even the messenger said, no, I'm speaking to you in in." Uh, uh, in, in your language, in the language of the Jews, so that they'll all know, and they'll all know that your king is trying to say, we're going to depend on God because there's no God in the land. So look around and see what God in the land has kept King Sennacherib from overtaking them. And he goes to listing a bunch of them. Did that God take care of them? Did that God free them? That's uh, the the great kings of Assyria have taken everything they wanted to take. And that's what he said, and that's where he left it. Let me read to you what Hezekiah prayed. And boy, if we'd pray like this, we, we, might, uh, we might see more happening as well. In uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 15, and Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, the one who dwells between the cherubim, you are God, you alone of all the kingdoms of the earth, you have made heaven and earth. Incline your ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which he has sent to reproach the living God. Truly, Lord, the kings of Assyria have laid waste the nations and their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they were not gods, but the work of man's hands, wood and stone. Therefore, they destroyed them. Now, therefore, O Lord our God, I pray, save us from his hand that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that you are the Lord God, you alone. Now get the setting both of 2 Kings and of 1 Corinthians. In 2 Kings, it was all about the might and power and the voice of the king. The king was saying, submit to us or we're, you're going to be destroyed. And they were sending their spokesmen back and forth. And even a letter was sent to Isaiah. And Isaiah gets a word from God, sends it back to uh, Hezekiah the king you don't have a chance and that's pretty much what he said you don't have a chance your God's not going to deliver you do not rely upon your God for no God in the land has kept the great Assyrian army from capturing them from uh, winning the battles over them and in 2 Kings chapter 19, next chapter over verse 35, listen to what happens. And it came to pass on a certain night that the angel of the Lord went out and killed in the camp of the Assyrians 185,000 men. And when people arose early in the morning, there were the corpses all dead. So Sennacherib king of Assyria departed and went away, returned home, and remained at Nineveh. Now it came to pass, as he was worshiping in the temple of Nishrach, his god, that his sons, Adaramalek and Shazara, 
struck him down with the sword, and they escaped into the hand into the land of Ararat, and Urshadon, his son, reigned in his place. Back to 1 Corinthians. The word of the Lord, the word of the cross is just moronic. It's foolishness. For it's written in the book of Isaiah, I'll destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. King Hezekiah didn't lift one finger. The Jewish people did nothing. But they went before God in prayer, and God intervened, and God completely handled the situation. And that's what Paul wants us to see in this passage, is that God is in control. God, uh, the preaching of the cross is folly to those that are perishing, because they don't understand. They're the, they're the Sennacheribs of the world. But to us who are being saved, it's the power of God, that God is on our side, that God is winning the victory, and it's not up to us, it's up to God. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Has God not made foolish the wisdom of the world? The, the wise quite literally is speaking about the Greek people and the scribe. Obviously, the Jewish people had scribes, and so it's quite possible that he's saying to the Jew and to the Gentile, to, 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 the, to, the, to, the, de, to the debater, to the, to the one arguing uh, about current events or current things or of this world, has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? The word wisdom is interesting. It's the word Sophia. Sophie or Sophia is the word for wisdom. Somebody tell me the word for uh, love in, in the Bible. What's, what, what is one of the words for love in the Greek language? Agape. That's God's love for us. What's brotherly love? Phileo, Phileo Sophia, that ring any bells? I think your King James Bible says philosophy. Philosophy is the love of words or the, the love of, of study, the love of, of uh, the things of this world, the love of the wisdom of this world. Read Ecclesiastes and see what uh, Solomon had to say about the wisdom of this world. And it's like chasing wind, he says over and over. It's just chasing wind, the philosophy of this world, the love of the things of this world, whether he talked about all kinds of things, nature and hard work and even wisdom, but it's the wisdom of this world. that All of it's just chasing after. Nothing wrong with, with school and studying and learning, if you realize that it's not that that's important. Uh, it's the things of God that's important. I like what John MacArthur, his comment on this was, we don't need philosophy because all good philosophy leads you to the Bible. So just read the Bible. All bad, the all bad philosophy, you don't need anyway, so reject it. So you don't need philosophy at all. Paul, when he arrived at Mars Hill in the book of Acts, and they were, they were all, the Greeks were famous for their philosophy. Plato and Socrates and Hippo, I think, and all those guys that uh, were uh, Greek philosophers, and that's, that, that's what they were known for. They just wanted to get together and try to figure out the universe and all that, and they had a placard to the unknown God, lest they offend a God they didn't, they didn't know. And Paul goes in and, and uh, introduces them to this unknown God. And he's the God of the cross. He's the, he's the God that uh, this world says is moronic, is foolishness. God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. 
It's not the DNC or the RNC that's going to save America, that's going to save the world. In fact, I know Rodney's on uh, Facebook and YouTube or whatever and all that, and some of you are, and I am. And we can get bent out of shape, and we can get quite angry. But we're not changing their mind. You know, just ask yourself, what would they have to do that have this uh, uh, philosophy of, of just the worldly philosophy? What would they have to do to change my mind? Well, I would say they're not going to. Well, I just flip that over. I'm not going to change theirs either, not through debating. They just want to debate. They just want to continue on talking about it. And that's, what, that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. He started out with 1 Corinthians. The first thing he talked about was division in the church. And this is one of the things, just, to, just philosophizing about all the things that, that uh, could happen or, or all the knowledge in the world, what, pick a subject. And God is saying that God has made foolish the wisdom of the world. For since in the wisdom of God, For sense and the wisdom of God. So what God decided, what God ordained and set up and created, for sense and the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. In other words, Paul is saying God chose something that the world thinks is stupid in order to save all those who would believe it. That's the plain and simple of it. You present the gospel. You present the message. You talk, invite people to church. You talk about uh, how to be righteous and all those things. God ordained that those things would bring us to faith. And yet the world looks at it and says, no thanks. That is just stupid. I've mentioned it before. There's things on YouTube where you can go out. And mainly where I see it's in the uh, beaches of California. These guys will go out with a microphone and they'll just start asking people questions about Jesus. And after a while, you just have to turn it off. You, you can't just sit there and listen to the thing that come out of people's mouths when you ask them what they think about Jesus. I mean, it's, it's just absurd. And it's because to them the message is a stupid message. In verse 22, For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. The Jews came to Jesus and said, Show us a sign so that we'll believe right after he took two fish and five loaves and fed 5,000 people. In the same context, they said, show us a sign. Where's your sign, if you know what I mean? That's just pretty dumb, isn't it? That's pretty stupid. The Jews demand signs. The Greeks seek philosophy, seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified. If you were here the day that I introduced 1 Corinthians and I had the, the drawing, the little cartoon drawing that went all the way through the, the, the book of, of 1 Corinthians, it said over and over that Paul's going to take all these issues and he's going to point them all right back to Christ. And 1 Corinthians is a book about issues. Let the women be silent in the church. Obviously was an issue in that church at that time that had to be addressed. Every issue in 1 Corinthians, he drives it right back to the cross and right back to Christ. And guys, that's still where we have to go today. All of our issues can be solved when we go back to Christ, when we have a relationship with Christ and we're walking with Christ and we're hand in hand and the Holy Spirit of God is indwelling and leading us. We make wise decisions. We have wisdom of which to handle all these other issues. We don't have to, we don't have to 
have a word about every issue. We have ten commandments. And we know that if we have the wisdom of God, we'll make decisions that please God. Kelly ran across a comment and I asked her about it. She said she didn't remember where it came from. You can't have a hunger for God when you keep nibbling on sin. And so fill in the blank, whatever the sin is, whether commission or omission. You can't be hungry for God when you're full of all the, you know, that's just stands to reading. You don't, you don't let your children eat all the ice cream they want right before you feed them dinner because they're already full of something else that's not as nutritious. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to choose, and folly to the Gentiles. The word stumbling block here is scandalon, where we get our word scandal. <laughs> Paul, I mean, look at what Paul said. We preach the Logos, or the gospel, as he called it in Romans. We preach Christ and him crucified as a scandal to the Jewish people and stupidity to the Gentiles. And that's our message. That's our rally cry. That's our flag. Look at us. We're the stupid, scandalous people because we're preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the rest of the world just shakes their head at it. No wonder they don't believe us. It's to them as a scandal. First century, you know, well, just tell them that the disciples stole their body. Or just tell them this or tell them that. Tell them he didn't even really die. He just kind of passed out and he, he got better and and. It's just a scandal. It was then, it is today. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, and you can't get away from that word either, to those that are called, because we were everyone dead in our sin, and but for the grace of God we would all still be dead in our sin. But the calling of God awakened our minds so that we saw that it wasn't scandalous. We saw that it wasn't moronic. What? Were we better? Did we just wake up one day and, and say, hey, I believe that story about a man dying 2,000 years ago for me. What prompted that? And what keeps it from prompting to the masses of the world as Jesus said the way to hell is broad and many are on it and the way to heaven's narrow and few are on it why, why didn't he say and, and let's reverse that but he didn't because the masses are not going to heaven they're going to hell because they're dead in their sins what happened to Adam in the garden has passed upon the whole human race. And what we better be saying, what if we really use wisdom, we will say, is drop to our knees and thank God that he did give Jesus to die for me and he opened my heart and mind that I might see and understand what happened on the cross. That's what true wisdom really is. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greek, Christ here it is the second time, the power of God. And so in Romans, the gospel was the power of God. In verse 18, it was the word of the cross is the power of God. But all of that ultimately, I think, comes down to this phrase, Christ is the power of God. Christ is the mystery that Paul talked about in other places that the world did not understand. Who could have envisioned, who could have thought that God, as, the, as God the Son, would 
be born of a virgin, having never known a man, and lived a perfect life and died on a cross so that my faith in that story, the preaching of the cross, would be what God would accept as payment for my sin. Who would have dreamed that up? Who would have thought that up? No one would have. Christ and God did that. Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. And in Romans 1.18, Paul called it the righteousness of God. It was righteous. It was right. It was wise. It was the power of God that redeemed a lost humanity from Satan's grasp that all of us would have died and went to hell except for what Christ did on the cross. For the foolishness, for the moronic acts of God, of which we know there's not, but what he's using that figuratively, speaking about the way the world believes. For the foolishness, the 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 least that God could do is wiser than men. And the weakness of God is stronger than men. Just ask Sennacherib. Ask Hezekiah which one was the stronger, which one won the battle. And it was in one night, 185,000 soldiers died at the hand of the angel of the Lord. And then later Sennacherib himself put to death by his own sons, not a Jewish man among them that did anything, God was in control. And we could use all kind of stories. Uh, Throughout the Bible, we see that to be true. That's the story of the Bible. Let's bow this morning.